Well, good morning to you, and um, I didn't expect the sunshine today. I would have still come to church, even if the sun hadn't been shining, but uh, anyway, um, just a few things. One, we have a thank you from the family of Rosalie Gray, and, uh, and uh, during a time like this, we realize how much our friends and relatives really mean to us, your expression of sympathy will always be remembered. The family of Rosalie Gray thanks you for your memorial contribution. And um, we had uh, yesterday, of course, uh, just it was just really a good day, a blessing to honor the life that was lived, uh, the um, service to honor our Lord, um, and the, the, the dinner afterwards was such a blessing. And I have to say something to you ladies, and I'll be careful with names, but uh, Linda and Sally and Julia and Carrie and, and Rich, but Rich wasn't one of the ladies, but Rich did. <laughs> Don't be offended. And then Wayne, and again, it gets dangerous listing names, but um, you talk about putting some work in. And I know there are others who would have liked to have helped and been a part of that and just circumstances that did not allow that. Um, but just uh, such a blessing, then it's, it's the spirit of that too, the spirit of, of serving and this gift of hospitality that, that you've been blessed with. So I'm sure the family yes. is much, so much appreciated. Well, I know they are because they said they were. <laughs> and uh, just the, if there just wasn't quite enough food though. That's, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wasn't that, uh, that was something else. So, um, let me continue stumbling along here. We are going to take a love offering today and next Sunday to help with the uh, funeral expenses with Debbie. And do it like we always do, write the check out or put it in an envelope. Uh, but if you write a check to Faith Fellowship and then in the memo line, Debbie Turk Funeral or, or whatever uh, you can, so it can be designated that way, it makes it... Uh, better for <clears throat> for Connie and uh, we had it in the bulletin last week but we'll again announce uh, our happiness that we are now regularly supporting Bible Tracks Inc. Uh, April 3rd men's study you know a week from Friday is Good Friday two weeks from today is Easter it doesn't seem like that but Good Friday service at 6 p.m. our Easter our resurrection day service will be at our normal worship time we will not have an evening service that day and uh, is are there any other announcements that I need to bring our attention to we have some yes just thank Debbie for the flowers if you would pass yes Here. yes yeah. thank thank Debbie for the flowers yeah. <clears throat> and I don't that they look this looks great up there does don't they and um, let me read something this we're going to sing this song and uh, maybe I was not 
I've shared with you probably at some point or another, a church, our Bible church that did most of my growing up in, we sang mostly gospel songs, things like that. I didn't really encounter some of these great hymns of the faith until we moved to the Chicago area. And of course at, at Moody, uh, we uh, discovered some, and then at Cicero Bible Church. I don't know where this one came in along the way, and maybe more of you are familiar. I thought maybe more of us would be familiar with it, but maybe not. But it's Jesus I Am Resting. It's not in our hymnal. I got it uh, online. But Jesus I Am Resting, Resting in the Joy of What Thou Art. I Am Finding Out the Greatness of Thy Loving Heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon Thee. Listen to this. And Thy beauty fills my soul. Now that's... A, <laughs> That's a pretty good place to be, isn't it? For by thy transforming power, thou hast made me whole. So we're going to sing that, isn't that great? Prayer requests. And there's a couple, let me just blurt them out. Uh, Debbie Dixon has been struggling with, um, help me carry, the sinus infection, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, the Leonard Haynes family. I want to keep them in our prayers. If you haven't gotten an email um, or a text that uh, Leonard is now on, on hospice. And um, keep, of course, Debbie and family in our prayers. Um, other prayer requests this morning. Connie yes. Bricker. Yes, thank you. Keep Connie Bricker. Uh, she's got heart concerns. And I want to keep her in our prayers. Yes. John's boys and their family and his brother and their family. Joe and his family is headed to Minnesota this morning. Okay. DJ and his family and Steve and his wife are headed to Florida. Okay. So if we could pray for traffic. Keep them, for yes. Um, our cousin has a great-granddaughter. She's one-year-old. She was born with a heart artery on the wrong side and uh, hip dysplasia, and she had to have heart surgery in mm. Iowa City. Uh, and how old is she again? One year old. Okay. Yeah, but last, what we were told yesterday is that they moved her out of intensive care and into a regular room. Okay. So please pray for her. Okay, yes, Randy. Tomorrow I uh, take <coughs> Kelly down to St. Louis to have uh, MRI on her brain, see if we can find it, and uh, she's got to have CAT scan. I might resemble that remark if you said that about me. She loves me and I don't blame her. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, we're taking her down there tomorrow, so we'll be gone most of the day. Yeah. Uh, and Friday I go back for, uh, it's not chemo, it's a uh, build up my immune system with an IV. Okay, okay. So... Yes. Right. I mean, Steve. Steve. Yeah, Steve. 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 Yep. Steve. Definitely. Okay. Well, you pray with me for the things I probably won't think to mention right now, but help me out. Lord, we just ask you to um, draw us before yourself right now and just um, all the distractions and uh, some of them good distractions and busyness this week. But uh, right now, it's time to worship you. And we're just very pleased to be here, that you've done this work in our hearts and minds, that we can come before you, humble ourselves before you, confess any sin that might be uh, coming between us and uh, allowing you to forgive that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness is to be together as the saints of God. And now we do as the saints of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can boldly approach the throne of grace because what you, Lord Jesus, have accomplished in our behalf. So we do lift all the travelers, uh, uh, BJ and, and Steve and families, and uh, Randy traveling tomorrow with this little uh, one-year-old baby uh, recovering from heart surgery for uh, Jennifer Haynes and family and for, for Leonard, uh, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, can, can speak the peace of Christ to him even 
at this time. We lift Steve and Janet before you and um, this uh, challenge that's before them. Lord, how good it is to know how much you care for us, how knowing you are, how powerful you are. Your love, your mercy, your grace extends for us, extends beyond the heavens. You, your care for us is really beyond our knowledge, but we're filled with it, just as this song. And I think of the song also, Lord, that all that thrills my soul is Jesus. So we lift these concerns before you and, and others that would be on our hearts and minds and uh, ask you to just draw our attention to yourself now. In Jesus' name, amen. On your song, we'll sing a verse and then here is the chorus. A verse and then here is the chorus. It says DC, that is the chorus. You'll, you'll love this song, I really do hope. It's great. Jesus, I am resting. The handout is in your bosom. Thou 
My faith has found a resting place. We will sing all four verses. We will not repeat the chorus at the end. Five, two, eight. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves this Sends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is lean. On the word, the written word of God, salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for. I can say that I am learning more and more to lean. What a beautiful song, what a beautiful thought.
Let's pray again. Help us, mighty one, to, to know who you are more completely and more fully, to, um, as you tell us, to lean on you, to trust in the Lord with all our hearts, to not lean on ourselves or our own understanding, but to trust you fully with life. We thank you for the joy of the refreshment um, the, the power of our Lord that we experience when, when we do that, when we believe you and truly trust in you and, and rest in you. We see your magnificence. We behold the glory of God, the majesty, your love, your wonderful patience with us. You call that long-suffering so long suffering with us Holy Spirit of God how you do it we don't know to live in us still yes redeemed but still frail fallen sometimes sinful creatures but again this is your love your power your plan your purpose that you will not only carry out to perfection but for our good and to your glory how we thank you for your word of truth. How we thank you for scripture. How we thank you, Spirit, for descending on us and opening our eyes and opening our ears and giving us soft hearts to receive the instruction of God and minds set on the Spirit that we might find life and peace through your words that you might produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That we might taste God, taste the Lord and see that he's good. Blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in you, mighty one. We've taken refuge in you this morning. We've bowed before you in worship. Holy Spirit of God, would you teach us now and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, let us fear. Therefore, let us fear is not what we would expect to hear from someone rallying the troops, which is what I believe the writer of Hebrews, this, I believe he is a pastor, writing to his church, you wouldn't expect, you would expect something more like Joshua said in Joshua 10.25. Joshua then said to them, do not fear or be dismayed, be strong and courageous. But the, the writer of Hebrews clearly calls his people as a group to fear. My first thought when I read this was that, well, he couldn't be doing that, calling them to fear, so he must be calling them to the fear of God, and indirectly he is. But fear, as in being afraid, is his primary emphasis. So then we receive that and we press on what is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us here. The big question is, when we look at the phrase, therefore let us fear, the big question is, why? And he reveals that as he continues in the verse. Hebrews 4.1, Therefore let us fear, lest, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have fallen short of it. Some in the church, <clears throat> some in the church had very good reason to be afraid. They thought they had entered God's rest, but they had not. They thought they were saved, but they were not. The promise to enter remained, but they were in grave danger of falling short. Here, the, the promise is there, but they may fall short. The ones in danger were, so to speak, on the membership roll, but their church was like Every church, every church I've been in, this, in, with members on the church roll whose names weren't on the roll in heaven. 
It was interesting because when I came in this morning, Wanda was playing when the role is called up yonder. And we're familiar with those role, with those, uh, with that song. And when the role is called up yonder, when the role is called up yonder, I'll be there. Except some of them were perilous, perilously close to not being there. And that was this pastor's concern. Every church will have people on the membership role who have not entered God's rest. And that means they are not saved. But the same people often become a vital part of the fellowship, furthering their delusion of right standing before God. So, enter stage right, the writer of Hebrews, a true shepherd of God, to rally the body, the church fellowship, to come together to confront the problem. So he writes, therefore, let us, let this group, let us fear. And what he's saying is, we will come alongside you and help you fear what you need to fear. That is a wonderful expression of love. And so far as it depends on us, we will bring you face to face with the reality of the threat to your eternal destiny. And that threat is this. And it's a clear and present danger. It was then and it is now. That some of you think you are saved and you are not. You think you have entered God's rest but God swears, and he does this multiple times, it's quoted in Hebrews, God swears that you will not enter his rest because of your unbelief and disobedience. So we, the body of Christ, so far as it depends on us, we are going to see to it that no one in our fellowship comes up short of heaven. Hebrews 3.12, we've looked at this, See to it, brothers, as much, and we looked at it then, so far as it depends on us, see to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And then, Lord willing, and by the mercy of God, we will, so far as it depends on us, snatch some of you, from the fires of hell. Do you remember uh, Tip praying? And it was pretty close to this. Thank you, Lord. He would just, just somewhere in that prayer, you would hear fairly often, thank you, Lord, for saving me from the fires of hell. I don't know if he got it from this Jude text or not. But Jude writes in Jude 22, and on some who are doubting, have mercy. See, it's a mercy mission also. And for others, save. Again, this is humans, not we can't save, but as much as it depends on us in obeying God, it's rescuing the perishing, but the perishing are in our midst, in our church. We don't pretend otherwise so we don't hurt someone's feelings because it's a real and present danger. It's a threat to their eternal destiny. And he says, for others, save snatching them out of the fire and on others have mercy with fear hating even the tunic polluted by the flesh the truth is fear sometimes saves now you maybe do not remember me saying it but i remember saying it i might have said it more than once because what we hear is be strong be courageous do not fear and i said I said, you don't hear God telling us in the Bible to fear. Well, he does it here. Now, it's not like really what I was saying. He, do, he doesn't do that. But just to provide some context. He said, it's not our fear, but it's in the body. We come alongside and we help this person. So we are exhorted to use fear, your first point in your outline, we are exhorted to use fear to save some from their unbelief. 
And see, this gives us, it really gives us some clarity on some things. And, and, and for me personally, it's affirming. And, and it's not just me. This isn't just something Dave Scott came up with. You, you hear uh, John MacArthur, John Piper, Alistair Begg, you hear these guys. It's the same, it's the same thought that there are so many people in our churches, so many people on the church role, sometimes in leadership. They're good, quote, Christian people. They're good, moral, upstanding citizens who don't know the Lord. But you don't want to upset anybody. Well, here we're said this is their eternal destiny. We risk losing the friendship. You risk losing your social standing. You obey God. You help them to confront the, th the very they, they should be afraid. So, Hebrews 3.18, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest and just another side note here. So what this is saying, let us fear, as I said, come alongside them because they, they only have this window of opportunity while on this earth, while living and breathing. They have this opportunity. The promise is there. But now is the time to obey. Now is the time to believe. The writer here who quoting the psalm would say, today is the day. Though a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have fallen short of it. The promise of entering God's rest remains, but God swears that the disobedient will not enter his rest. Bringing a person to fear the consequences of his disobedience is sometimes what is needed to save him from his unbelief. And this is what Jude was speaking of. This is... You love someone this much that you speak. Help them to examine if their faith is gentle, is, is genuine. So, and what Jude, Jude speaks of it very dramatically. He says it's like snatching them out of the fire. Unbelief results in disobedience. Everyone believes something. So we have to understand that biblically, unbelief means that the person doesn't believe God. And I know that's maybe over explaining, but just to have that in our mind when it says unbelief, well, everybody believes something. Everybody's got their own thought, their own opinion. But unbelief is biblically is not believing God. And it's shown that you don't believe God if you don't obey God. The best, most loving action toward those who have an unbelieving heart is to bring them to fear the consequences of their disobedience. So sometimes you might hear a message and it's, it's hellfire and brimstone. Oh, this is why. And you're thinking, is, is, that, is, that, is he speaking to me? Well, not if you're a born-again believer. Not if you've been saved, washed your robes in the blood of the Lamb. But we do these things to reach those who are not, who are at this point are pretenders. The disobedient ones addressed here were in danger of falling back into Judaism and previous misconceptions of God and salvation. And what that is, there's, there's a whole lot more behind that, but it, it, it's, it, here it was Judaism. And they were, it was like kind of coming out of that. And coming close, and this helps us to understand Hebrews, and it'll help us as we continue on through Hebrews. When we hear these things falling away, or later on you hear they came close but fell away. This what this is. It, it's not actual belief and trust and obedience. What it is is, is I'm, should I switch my religious values for these religious values? And the person weighs them out, and when they fall away, what they say is, I think I'm going to stick with what I've got. And they never come to repentance and confession. They never come to changing their mind. They never come to then saying the same thing that God says and receiving, actually believing in Christ. As a church, we need to see to it 
and bring this fear into the lives of those who are disobedient in our fellowship to purge them of their unbelief. Is, is it, you know, the Romans 13, 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Is it, should we love the people around us? Yes, we should. But sometimes we replace what God means by loving that person with what we would prefer to do that kind of keeps the heat off of us. Sometimes, you, when you love that person, to them it appears like you're upset with them. And you have to bear that burden in the name of love, in the name of mercy, in the name of carrying a true gospel because you're interested in snatching them from the fires of hell. In other words, when you love as God calls us to love, very often that will be misunderstood. Just take it, the simple presentation of the gospel and getting someone to face the fact that they're a sinner under the wrath of God. And people would say, that is just so negative, that is not positive, and we, we need to affirm this person. After all, in our situation here, they're in church. In church doesn't mean you're saved, though, does it? You guys know that. You know that. So, we need to see to it. Hebrews 3, 12, again, I read it earlier, but you can mark that down. See to it, brothers, and we could say, and sisters. And it's, it's what I shared a week or two ago. So far as it depends on you, I took that from the Romans 12, 17, I think it was, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. In other words, we look out for each other. In any fellowship, and this is what I believe that the writer of Hebrews, he knows his church. He knows there are saved people, and he knows there are people who are not saved, but think they are, or they're really confused. And so, it, but what, he, what I believe the message here is, but you know what? You're part of my group, so I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to do everything. And this man had a pastor's heart. He was going to reach every, he did, he's not, he, everybody, in the group, everybody in the group that came out on the Lord's Day or what, however he was associated with them, his intent was to confront them. Are you right in right standing before the Lord God the Almighty? So fear may be used for good as a powerful weapon to free the captive mind of the unsaved by turning their thoughts to God. And that's the, the, the unsaved, their mind is a slave. By default, humans demand the right to exercise free will in choosing what they believe to be right and wrong, good and evil. We know that begins in Genesis 3, doesn't it? But the freedom they think they have is in reality an enslaved mind that is set on self and it ends in death. And so every act of what they would call love or any good deed, it, it first it, they're considering themselves, Romans 8, 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death. That's on, on me, on my humanity, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So if we could open up our brain <clears throat> and we could see the setting, what is your mind set on? Is it set on the flesh or is it set on the spirit? Romans 6.16, do you not know that when you go on presenting yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin leading to death of, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now you can obey or seemingly obey and not truly be saved, but obey, obedience is a fruit of salvation. Fear, when used as intended in this text, is I believe the the writer of Hebrews intends it may be enough to save some and change the direction of the person's mind from death to life and peace. Where is your, what direction is your, what is the setting of your mind? Helping someone to fear as directed in this text may save them from their foolishness. And we see 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And you're familiar with the song, Rescue the Perishing. This is how you rescue the perishing. You help them to see their mind is set in the wrong direction. 
this person's mind is set on the flesh. They're enslaved to that and to this world. And the gospel comes to them. What could save them and bring all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ to their life? What could have them live forever in the glory with, with God in his glory? And they see that because their mind, the setting of their mind, and they see that and they say that's foolishness. That's how far off the human mind is. And I'm not just talking about the physical mind, but the whole idea of mind, heart, soul, spirit. It says, foolishness to those who are perishing, but listen to the ones who have their mind set on the spirit. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Second main point this morning, the good news of the promise to enter God's rest remains, but only those who hear it with faith will profit from the good news. So what he's going to say, basically, the, the promise is given, and there's two groups of people. They both hear it, but only one hears it with faith. And that means only one hears it and believes. Hebrews 4, 2, For indeed we have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they also, but the word that was heard did not profit those who were not united with faith among those who heard. A person only profits from the good news when he hears with faith. And we hear the same concept in Galatians 3, 2 from Paul. This is the only thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? You're hearing and believing. Galatians 3, 5. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit <clears throat> and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? To hear with faith means we hear and believe. God could not make it any more clear that the one who does not believe him will not enter his rest. It really, it's, it's kind of stunning how many times he repeats this. And it's to Hebrews 3.11. As, I mean, it can't get any more clear, more, more clearly defined, more, more bold, more out front. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And that's saying they will not be saved. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we we justified in Christ. We have peace with God. That's this whole thing. It's salvation. He said, I swear in my wrath. And God really does say it's my way or the highway. It really, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, we, we say that so quickly, but it's, and, and no one comes to the Father except by me. And if you want to hear the Father, he just told you, I swear in my wrath, no one comes to me except for through my Son. Fear, when used as intended in this text, may also bring the person into the presence of God where he or she can hear what is necessary to enter God's rest. And what I mean by that is, is this the fear that we, we bring them to, we come alongside, we bring them to this fear, we help them to see the perilous condition they're in, and that brings them into the presence of God, gives them an opportunity then to change their mind, to repent, to change their mind from me believing what I believe to believing what God believes. And that when fear has done its saving work, <clears throat> and this is important, to see this, there's because there's a fruit that comes from the work of God. Because we sometimes have, and again it's for our own selfish interests, that someone, we, we maybe lead someone to the Lord, but that no fruit ever is appears from that. Sometimes it's a relative. But for our sake, because we don't want to have that on our mind, we want to believe that this person is saved. <clears throat> so we ignore what's before us. But when God saves someone, he, he saves someone. What does it say? We're a new creature. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Something happens. You went from being dead in sin to alive in Christ. Something happened. So you see fruit. Maybe, not, maybe more in some than others, but you will see something. So here, when fear has done its saving work, the person changes his mind and forsakes his way and thoughts for God's way and thoughts. And I got this from Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man 
his thoughts. This is striving to enter through the narrow door or the narrow gate. This is striving then that this person is, is going to come here and say, I can continue to believe what I believe or I can believe what I think God is telling me. Some of them would fall away. They would continue to believe the, 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 wicked, the, the, the wicked, his way. Hang on, stay with that. Stay with his thoughts. And so the battle then is to believe what God says. The, and, then, and let him return so, to Yahweh, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, here it comes, so will my word, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Third main point this morning, those who believe enter God's rest just as surely as those who are disobedient will not enter his rest. The promise remains, if you believe you will enter his re rest, <clears throat> on the, where God said, and I swear in my wrath, they, the unbelieving, the disobedient, will not, well, just as sure as that is, is sure that if you believe, you will enter his rest. For we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken somewhere in this way. And it's <clears throat> interesting because um, some of these things that you don't think of, a couple of things. We had this a few weeks ago, and it referred to Psalm 8. And it said, you know, you know, somewhere it was spoken of this, and it's referring to Scripture. Well, we know it as Psalm 8. And here uh, we would know it in, in Genesis 1. But whoever I was listening to at the time, they said it wasn't designated Genesis 1 at that time. It was God's Word, all the, the, the book titles and the chapters and the verses. But it, what it's saying is, for he has spoken somewhere in this way concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. God just won't let go of it. <laughs> he keep, it's like, have we said it enough times, they're not going to enter my rest. Now, why does God keep doing that? Because we're slow to pick it up. If you don't believe, if you don't repent and change your mind and believe what God says, confess what God says, if you don't believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you'll not enter his rest. You will not, the roll will be called up yonder. You will not be there. God swears in his wrath. And he just keeps repeating it. They shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them failed to enter because of disobedience. <clears throat> he again determines a certain day. He's saying, okay, they haven't got the message yet, but it's today. And this is another thing that's repeated. He gets, today's the day. Is it today? Then it's time to believe. If it's today, then you still have opportunity to believe. If it's, if it's today, you still have opportunity to enter the kingdom of God. He again determines a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So what's it saying? I've got my beliefs. I've got my, my old religion, whether it was Judaism or just our personal philosophy of life. And here's what God's saying, and I'm, I'm weighing it out, and I'm striving in my mind to enter through the narrow gate or the narrow door that's striving is, who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe God, or am I going to stay with my stuff? And that's what it means, hardening your heart. You just say, no, I'm going with God. I'm turning away from my foolishness, and I'm believing God. And if you, the, 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 the more you contend against God, our heart gets harder, 
speaks of the Ephesian, in Ephesians, Paul speaks of the Gentiles, the callousness that continues to develop. The heart gets harder and harder. They descend further and further into the darkness. So, if we believe we enter God's rest, today is the day to believe God. If we do not believe, God swears that we will not enter his rest. God invites us, <clears throat> and we'll get into this, it just, we'll just touch the surface, really. Not that it's not worthy of more time. <clears throat> But God invites us to the same rest he enjoyed when he rested on the seventh day. And just a little snippet there. If you can picture, and I hadn't, hadn't thought through these things before. That's the, 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 the wonder, the, the joy of studying scripture, of, of, of uh, going through a book. That, um, that this, this rest that God, he, he spoke the world into being. He said it was good, it was good, it was very good and he said i'm i'm done with that and it gives us an example then of christ it is finished it's a finished work you've heard the finished work of christ that's salvation by grace through faith not of works not a result of anything we've done but by grace we have been saved <clears throat> God invites us to enjoy the same rest he enjoyed. And we'll, un we'll understand this because this is the rest. This is another way of thinking our salvation, our time with God in, in eternity. We enter God's rest through Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Fourth, the promise of <clears throat> entering God's rest remains for the people of God. Verses 8 and 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The rest, and we looked at this last week, that there was a rest of that taking them into the promised land and giving them literal rest from their enemies, conquering the land, possessing the land, and rest from their enemies. But even then, it was more than that. It still, it looked ahead to eternity, to rest forever with God. And that's what it's saying here, <clears throat> that the second group did go in and conquer the land. But that doesn't mean that, that well, that was the rest, and then it's not available. No, that was the rest for them, giving them the land, helping them to occupy, enjoy the fruit of the land. But the true rest is rest with God forever and ever. Uh, fifth, entering God's great rest is by grace through faith, no works. God's done all the work. He's rested. All we are to do is believe. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work as God did from his Romans 4, 4, and 5, not to the one his, who works. His wage <clears throat> is not accounted to, according to grace, but according to what is due. What that means is if you're working, you say, well, I've got to do this many things, whatever it is that you add to it. And it says, well, now you've taken yourself, you're no longer in grace. But well, we'll pay you for what you've done. But the thing is, is your pay gets you nowhere with God. But to the one who does not work but believes... Upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. Second Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but now look what is added to that. Not only it's not our works, but it is according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, from eternity past to eternity future, as we say. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Six, to be diligent to enter God's rest is to strive to believe God above everything else. This, as I've already expressed, is a battle for the mind. Hebrews 4, 11, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall into the same example of disobedience. 
The diligence here is not working for our salvation, but striving in our heart and soul to believe God and find rest in him. I'll let you read. You've got the Jeremiah 6, 16. You'll find rest for your souls, but they said we will not walk in it. Next, the person who is not diligent in this way ultimately fails in three ways. So the diligence here is striving back again. Here's what I believe. Here's what God says I should believe. The person who is diligent to enter God's rest will strive to believe and will come and the one who enters God's rest will come to that point of belief. The person who does not is not diligent in this way. He loses the battle for his mind. The setting is never changed in his mind from death to life and peace. The setting is never changed in his mind from the flesh to the spirit. He loses the battle for his mind. He never comes to believe God. He falls further into disobedience, resulting in belief in a, in a false gospel. Entering God's rest in Hebrews is the same concept Jesus speaks of as entering the way that leads to life, salvation through the narrow door and the narrow gate. Luke 13, 23, and someone said to him, are there just a few who are being saved? They say that in response to what Christ was teaching them. It's like, it doesn't sound like there's very many going. And he said to them, strive, don't worry about that. You strive to enter through the narrow door. And again, the striving there is not working to do, it's, it's, it's striving to believe God. That's where the battle in the mind. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Matthew 7, 13, same idea, a little different. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And what we do is we, we some of these things are hard to understand, but what you do is you don't, we accept what God says. That's what I'm trying to say. We accept what God says. And so I want to make some observations. And um, really, if I had had more time, I would, I would want, I, I, think we're, I think this is going to yield some more things. But I want to make some observations in conclusion and then some deductions from those. But I want us to see, as we go through this, how relevant this is. To the gospel and 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 the light that it sheds on people's approach to uh, coming to to formulate a gospel to to share the gospel to believe the gospel so observations some observations concerning entering the door or gate of salvation and I say that because it says there that the, um, the uh, where is it are there just a few saved, strived into, da, 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 da. well, anyway, I'm losing my place, so maybe I'll, oh, the way is constricted that leads to life. That's where I was going. Okay, some observations. The person is to strive to enter. Okay, so we can just, that. okay, whatever you want to call it, we see that they're to strive to enter. Many will not be able, will not be able to enter the door that leads to life. Another observation. Many will enter the wide gate that leads to destruction. The many who enter through the wide gate are satisfied with entering a way that promises life without examining where it leads. Now that was a little bit observation and deduction. But the point there being is there was a gate and it's promised the way of life, but that way ends in destruction. And apparently, they weren't concerned about that. And as we looked at yesterday in Ecclesiastes, to live well now, you need to have the end in mind. We are commanded, and this is important, we are commanded to enter a certain gate, the narrow gate. The narrow gate opens to the way that leads to life. Few, and Jesus said, he's the gate, didn't he? Few even find the gate that opens to the way that leads to life. Now, that's very important, that few even find the gate. If I could jump ahead on my observations then. So, is the gospel then, in some way, the gate that, that leads to life, that brings you to life? So, if you think then, that here it says, few even find the gate. 
What is that telling us? That few find the true gospel. Do we see how relevant this is? We, you know, and well, let me just go to, I'm, let me just go to deductions. Some deductions from the previous observations. Striving to enter seems to fit very well with the admonition in Hebrews to pay much closer attention. Hebrews 2.1, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. So, what I was saying then, back to the number seven on the observations, few even find the gate that opens to the way that leads to life. We need to pay much closer attention or you won't find the gospel. You can, you can just be satisfied with someone giving you a promise of something. Or we can say, no, I want, because what did we learn today? God says, I swear in my wrath, they, the unbelieving and the disobedient, will not enter my rest. There's incentive to pay much closer attention to find the, the gospel we're believing and the gospel we're sharing to be the good news of God, that the person will not hear that, that God, they will be welcomed into the kingdom. So, second, many people who seek salvation and the way that leads to life do not strive for the truth, but are easily satisfied with a promise of life. Now think how relevant that is with some of the stuff we hear. And not just nowadays, it's been like this from the beginning. People are offered a gospel. It kind of sounds like what God says. In fact, they may even use some of the same words. <clears throat> and by the way, I can pretty much keep living as I'm living and punch my ticket to heaven with that gospel. But they never give serious consideration to the end of the road. Next, we should strive to believe and share a gospel that saves. Well, see, that's well, should we, we shouldn't even have to say that, should we? But if we look at this, where, what Christ is trying to bring their attention to, what the writer of Hebrews tries to bring our attention to, we need to pay much closer attention. We've got to pay much closer attention, so we're offering a gospel that actually saves them from their sins and brings to them the gift of eternal life. 2 Corinthians, and not one that merely accommodates. 2 Corinthians, for we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sin, now listen to these. <clears throat> but as from, well, I might have these underlined in your notes too. So four here. But as from sincerity, but as from God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. You know what Paul's showing there? He's showing that he's paying much closer attention to what he's heard. And then fourth, there's one gospel that saves. There's a lot of gospels out there. Some of them are so close. We looked when we were in Galatians. It was that close to the gospel. And Paul wrote in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, but if you believe that gospel, you were accursed. See, our, our perspective has to be eternity, folks. It, it can't be just all of our social standing, friendships, family, all these things. It has to be eternity. We have to see everything. As a believer, one, well, you'll, well, you'll understand that more whether you're a believer or not because one day the reality will hit, hit the person. We need to understand that now if we truly love our neighbors, if we truly love our co-workers, our family members, we will risk being unloved to present to them a gospel that actually saves. If you think about it, God says, I swore in my wrath. You say, Dave, you just keep saying it. Well, God keeps saying it. I swear in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Think of that. And then think of what Christ says later in Matthew 7. When they say, Lord, Lord, 
and he said, you get away from me. I never knew you. We could say, you're not part of my, he, that Christ would say, you shall not enter my rest. I never knew you. And they were what they thought to be good church people. This is the heart of the writer of Hebrews calling us to live in plain view of the Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. Mighty One, thank you for this day, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you that we could come together and worship. Help us now as we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, what you've done for us, Lord Jesus. Help us to be faithful to you, to love you first and foremost. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you for, for everything. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.